the demon of Kalerman known as Tash, whose arrival would signal the end of Narnia itself. We discussed this dark and evil creature in the previous episode, but today we're going to dive headlong into one of the most pressing questions often asked about Tash, and in the process, we'll take a look at some very interesting theories about this vile and mysterious being. Now there are some great theories in store today, so let's get started. It's time to leave the Shadowlands behind and step into a world that's more real than our own. It's time to follow me into the wardrobe. There's something about Tash that just doesn't belong in Narnia. He isn't a talking animal, he isn't a mythical being, and he certainly isn't a typical humanoid like a man or a giant. No, Tash is unlike anything we've ever seen in Narnia. The question is, what is he? And how exactly did he get to Narnia? Well, today, we're going to look at three of the most compelling theories I've come across. Let's talk about the first option now, in theory number one. Theory one, Tash the Cursed. Now, this is a very interesting theory because it involves some of the very obscure, but very important history of Narnia. In fact, in doing some research, I've discovered some very amazing clues for this theory, scattered throughout the entire history of the Narnian timeline. The first clue has to do with the fact that Tash is an exclusively Kalermin god. In fact, he's worshipped in the great city of his namesake, Tashban. There's obviously an important connection between the origin of this great country and the history of Tash himself. Why would the Kalermans alone carry such a strong connection with Tash? Did Tash himself originate in Kalerman? Then there's also an interesting clue found within the traditions of the Kalermine culture. You see, as a proclamation of status, the Kalermine ruling class actually claim to be of the same bloodline as Tash. Erebus herself traced her lineage back five generations to Ardeeb Tisrock, who she claimed was, and I quote, descended on a right line from the god Tash. Now, suppose this wasn't just some insanely arrogant bragging from Erebus. Suppose it was actually true. How could any son of Adam or daughter of Eve descend from such a vile creature, you ask? Well, the answer may lie in the third clue. You see, if you trace the history of Kalerman, you'll discover that after less than a century since the first Archenland outlaws settled in that great southern land, some Kalermine settlers moved northwest to establish settlements in the area now known as Telmar. Now, here's where things get interesting. Tucked away in a single entry from C.S. Lewis's personal timeline of Narnia, we learn that after only two years of settling, the Kalermine colony in Telmar behaved so wickedly that Aslan himself turned them all into dumb beasts. Now we don't know what these settlers did exactly, but it must have been something truly horrendous, because it seems to be the only time in Narnian history that Aslan punished an entire group of humans by turning them into animals. However, there was one more Kalerman who received a similar punishment, and that's our final clue. After a failed attempt to invade Archenland and then Narnia, Prince Rabadash received a humiliating and fitting punishment from Aslan. What was his punishment? He was turned into a donkey. And where did Aslan send Rabadash to be tethered for the rest of his life? He sent him directly into the heart of Tashban, to the great and terrible Temple of Tash. So how do all these clues come together? Well, let me paint you a picture. Let's return to that Kalamine colony where that unspeakable and terrible act occurred. It would be reasonable to assume that these settlers, who were all turned into dumb beasts, had to have had a leader who would bear ultimate responsibility for this act. After all, it would take orchestration and organization to commit such a horrendous crime. And if the followers of this evil leader received such a terrible punishment, Imagine what sort of punishment their leader must have received. What if instead of becoming a mere beast as punishment, what if Aslan's justice demanded a greater punishment? Could he have made this man into a monster? The one we now call Tash? Well, that's one theory. Let's go ahead and take a look at the next theory. Tash, the Fallen Star. In Narnia, stars are not just balls of burning gas. 
As Eustace discovers in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, stars are actually sentient beings set into place by Aslan to watch over the world and tread the great dance across the sky. However, we learn that not all stars keep their place in the sky. Ramandu was a fallen star who appeared in the form of a human to the crew of the Dawn Treader. Now, Ramandu fell to Earth because he was very old, but there's another reason stars can lose their place in the sky, because they're cast to Earth by Aslan himself. In fact, Korokin the Magician was also once a star, but was cast to Earth as a punishment after committing an unspoken offense. Now, the concept of sentient stars and even falling stars aren't unique to Narnia. In the Bible, in fact, stars are often symbolic of angels. In the book of Revelation, John sees seven stars which represent the seven angels of the seven churches. And in the Bible, stars that are cast out of the sky are sometimes considered symbolic of angels being cast out of heaven as punishment for their rebellion. These angels are transformed into hideous demons that roam the earth. Now these demons are also associated with the worship of idols, that is, demons who are said to masquerade as false gods, compelling people to worship them with sacrifices and other acts of devotion. Now one more interesting thing about fallen stars in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, stars that fall out of the sky are depicted as angels bringing about the end of the world. In Revelation chapter 8, a star falls out of the sky and is given the keys to the pit of the abyss. Now some believe this king of the abyss is the angel Abaddon, which means the destroyer. And incidentally, Tashkent is the name of a World War II Soviet destroyer, but that's probably just a weird coincidence. Back to the theory. Is it possible that Tash was once a great and shining star in the Narnian sky, which, as the result of a great misdeed, was cast down to earth, transforming into the demon that he is now? Could the demon Tash have established a powerful but false religion in Calumet, with the great idol to himself residing in the very center of the city? Now, whether or not you find this theory convincing, it can't be denied that it certainly is very compelling. Now, let's talk about this third and final theory, Tash the Demon of Charn. So, I saved this third theory for last because it really is something amazing. In doing my research for this episode, I stumbled upon an obscure blog whose author seemed to stumble himself into the creation of this theory. I posted a link to the blog in the video description below. Be sure to check it out. The blogger, who goes by the handle Bookworm, begins by examining the only two images of Tash that were given in the entirety of the series. The first thing he noticed in these images was Tash's clothing. His wardrobe is markedly different than the Kalermin style of fashion. Kalermin clothing was reflective of a desert culture, perhaps similar to Arabian or Persian style clothing. But Tash's outfit was much more similar to a blend of ancient South American or Babylonian clothes. No, Tash's clothing clearly wasn't influenced by the Kalermin culture. It must have come from somewhere else. But where? The Arkenlander's costume seemed to be inspired by Spanish medieval fashions, and the Telmarines are reminiscent of a sort of French medieval style. None of these seemed to match. And that's when Bookworm remembered this image. The royal family of Charn. Their clothing certainly seemed reminiscent of Tasha's Babylonian style, but it wasn't until Bookworm explored some of the other features of Charn that he noticed this incredible clue. He initially stopped to examine the winged statue in this illustration, but then his eyes were drawn to the Mayan relief styled carvings covering the edges of the gateway. Do you see it? Hidden in plain sight amongst the various icons and figurines, there's a carving that looks amazingly like Tash. Could it be that Tash's home world was actually Charn? What if Tash actually was a demon, but a Charnian demon? Now, here's where my theory takes its own departure. Jadis herself said that during her life in Charn, in order to learn the despicable word, she paid a great and terrible price. Could it be possible that the price she paid was that of her very own soul? Did Jadis allow herself to become possessed by Tash? 
If so, it would explain a lot. It would explain her nearly maniacal actions and superhuman strength when she descended upon London, and her sudden change in appearance in the wood between the worlds. When Aslan told Diggory that he had brought evil into Narnia, was he not actually speaking of Jadis alone, but also of Tash? Mr. Beaver claimed that Jadis was half Jinn, an Arabic type of demon. If it was Tash that was truly the being occupying the body of Jadis, it might explain why Jadis and Tash both claim the right to their lawful prey according to the laws of the deep magic. We know that Kalerman was founded at the beginning of the Narnian 3rd century, while Jadis was hiding in exile from Narnia. Could she have visited the Kalermans during that time? Could Tash's true form have been revealed, thus establishing the same religion that the readers would encounter 600 years later? Of course, we'll never know for certain, but this is definitely one of my favorite Narnia theories to date. Well, that's all the time we have for today. But before you go, I'm excited to make a very special announcement. In celebration of the channel reaching 10,000 subscribers, and as a special thank you to the wardrobe community, I'll be hosting a very special event, the very first Into the Wardrobe live stream. I'll be taking your questions and discussing your theories live and unscripted. It's coming up on Saturday, October 16th, also known as Narnia Day. It's going to be something you don't want to miss, so be sure to subscribe so you can be notified when we're going live. And as always, I look forward to joining you next time as we take another journey into the wardrobe.